Hello everyone, how are you today? Um, I'm Ian, I'm a software developer from Brazil and I'm going to talk to you today about writing secure code in Python. So let's start. Um, okay, so first things first. I'm sure uh, everyone who's worked with Python or even just messed a little with the language has heard this before, that programming in Python is easy. And I don't disagree with that. I, in fact, I think it's one of the core strengths of the language. However, I believe people sometimes can't seem to understand that while it's really easy to create a Python program that executes, it's not always so trivial to write a quality code that is both Pythonic and secure. Today, of course, I'm going to focus on the security side. So over the years working as a Python developer, I got a chance to observe a few patterns with Python code that sometimes we as developers don't think too much about and may end becoming a security risk. So I made a list and that's basically what I'm going to show you today. Some topics may seem more obvious than others, especially for you that are more experienced users, but overall we got a bunch of cool things to talk about. And the first of these topics I want to talk about concerns the eval function and uh, we'll call uh, eval is really dangerous. For those of you that aren't familiar, eval is a building function that uh, basically evaluates a Python expression and returns its result. So uh, here on the side, I added a few examples of how the function can be used. And the first two examples uh, are simple mathematical expressions. But in the third example here, uh, we can see that uh, eval has access to other built-in functions like sum. And in the fourth, the, the last example, we see that uh, Evo even uh, has access to variables we declare outside. Uh, we can also pass two optional parameters to the Evo function, that is globals and locals, which are basically dictionaries that control what will be the global and local objects that the function will have access to. So uh, the danger begins when uh, a user tries to evaluate a malicious expression, such as this example uh, in which I'm using the os.system function to remove all the files in the computer. Uh, of course, a, a Linux computer or a Unix computer. Uh, however, um, considering we can control the global variables, maybe we can manage to securely run Evo. So uh, we can try to pass uh, an empty dict as the globals argument, as you can see here. And well, that works. So uh, we get uh, a name error because uh, since the globals is empty, the evo function won't have access to what was imported. So uh, OS uh, got a name error. The problem here is that Python automatically inserts buildings to the globals dictionary in evo. So even uh, if we don't have access to the imported OS model because we, we send uh, an empty globals dictionary, we can still import it ourselves using the building function uh, done during import. So, yeah, so, but then again, uh, what if we specifically clean the buildings? So instead of just uh, sending an empty dict as the globals argument, we pass a dict with the done building keys set to an empty dict. And once again, that will work. Uh, we get uh, again a name error because now we don't even have the building functions, so we, then the import is not a function Evo has access. But despite not having all of this, we can still manage to create uh, uh, a payload with this because we can create any Python object using its literal form. So this means we can create a tuple by instantiating the tuple class, for example, but we can create it using the literal form, that is the parentheses. And well, Python objects can get us very far. So here, oops, in this image, uh, I'm showing that uh, we've, if we have access to the Dunder class attribute of the tuple, we get the tuple class. If we then ask access the Dunder base attribute, we get the object class. And we know that in Python, everything is an object. So if we get the Dunder subclasses uh, method from the, the, the object class, we will get all subclasses of object, that, mean, that means everything that, is, um, that has been created in this, in this instance of the, the interpreter. 
So, uh, okay, so this is all the loaded classes right now, and the class we're looking for is uh, this one, the built-in importer class, because with that we can import any module we want. Uh, so, okay, to create uh, a payload, we would have to iterate through the, the subclasses, looking for the one called built-in importer. So we can instantiate it and call uh, the method load module to import the model we want. Uh, however, for that to work in Evo, we need to make it one line. Uh, fortunately, we can do that using a list comprehension. And I got this piece of code specifically from netsec.expert. Uh, you should check them out later. Um, so yeah, we can't create a, a safe Evo. But uh, so how? Uh, what are our alternatives? What can we use? Well, we can use the literal Evo function that is from the AST module but that only works to create objects using their literal form. We can really evaluate expressions as we can with Evo. So uh, in this example, I'm, I'm showing that uh, we can turn any uh, number from a string to uh, the, the, the number object in Python. Uh, we can turn uh, a tuple written in the, its literal form to uh, a tuple, but we can really evaluate uh, a simple mathematical expression. It will raise the value error. Uh, if we need to evaluate a, a more complex expression, uh, we should do uh, string parsing. We should parse the string and implement the, the, the expression ourselves instead of just running to evolve. So basically, in conclusion for that part, uh, when should we use evolve? And my answer to that is when there is no other viable way to accomplish a task. And Working with Python, you eventually find out that this basically means never, you should never use Evo. So that's it for the first part. Okay, now passing on to arbitrary code execution with Pico. Uh, the Pico module is used to serialize Python objects to a sequence of bytes. So if you need a simple way to store a Python object uh, and you don't want to use a database or something like that, you can serialize it using the pico.dump function and save it to bytes and deserialize it later with the pico.load function. And the dump function uh, accepts an optional argument called protocol, which is an integer denoting the protocol used for deserialization. Currently, we have five options for protocols that goes from zero, which is the oldest and the human readable one, to five, which is available since Python 3.8. Yeah, so uh, on the right, I have uh, a few examples uh, for using Pico, but I won't go into detail with that because we don't have so much time. Uh, okay, but, uh, and Python usually knows how to serialize all kinds of objects. But if we need to customize uh, how a, an object is serialized, so how a, a, an instance of a specific class is serialized, we can do that using the magic method then the reduce. Uh, the method should return a string or a tuple containing a callable and its parameters. And that's what we're going to focus. We're focusing on the return of a tuple with a callable and its parameters. So here uh, we create uh, a class called exploit pico that has a custom done the reduce method that returns os.system, the function as its callable, and the rmrf uh, command to delete all files, as I showed in the previous example as its arguments. So if we serialize an object of this class and then load it, so here is serializing it, and now we're loading. Uh, as soon as we load it, boom, the, the os.system function will be called and uh, our files will be deleted if the interpreter has the proper permission. So the uh, callable we, we, specific, we set here will be called with the parameters we set here. Um, yeah. We can see uh, what's happening uh, behind the scenes with the model pickle tools. So using the pickle tools, uh, this function, we can read the raw pickle code and understand how it works. So here is the, the pickle code for what we just did. Uh, let's read it to, to understand how a pickle works. So first it uses the C character here uh, to import a function. In this case, it's important the system function from POSIX. Uh, the function is separated from the model by a line break. We can see the line break here uh, on the on the raw pico. Uh, yeah, and then it uses an open parenthesis here, um, column 14, to indicate 
uh, what are the arguments that are going to be passed to this function. Uh, in this case, it's a Unicode string, so we use uh, an uppercase V to denote that we're, uh, that we're passing an Unicode string. And then we, uh, we, we write the, the string we want to uh, call, so uh, we want to use as a parameter. So the string is here, you can see the, we have the uppercase V, the string, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, since this is the only parameter, uh, we just close the, the parentheses, we open and con 14, but we, close, we don't close with a closing parentheses, we close with a, with a lowercase t. Uh, and then on column 25, uh, we have an uppercase r, that's it, that is for reduce, uh, and this means we're calling the function. So we're calling the function with the arguments we provided first. And then on, on column 26, we have a dot that is denoting that the, uh, the, the pico ended. Okay, but what if we want to execute arbitrary code? Uh, because uh, I just show you how you can uh, execute a simple function, but if I want something more complex, like a reverse shell that will need a few lines of code, as I'm showing here in this example, uh, the os.system example, uh, won't be the best option. So I want to execute lines of code. I want to, ex to execute uh, a custom function. So uh, we would need to serialize this custom function, but Pico can really serialize code. Uh, what can serialize code is another Python model called Marshall. And Marshall works uh, pretty similarly as Pico. So uh, we use marshall.dumps with the dunder code for, uh, from the, the attribute from the function we created reverse shell, and we get uh, the bytes, uh, that is the, the serialized function. Uh, we can then uh, encode with base64 these bytes just to have uh, uh, a more readable and uh, basically useful uh, form of serialized code. And to run it, we basically do the uh, reverse way, what we just did. So we decode it with base64, we load it with Marshall, and we have to turn the, the code object because uh, remember we use the we, we use the then the code attribute to, to serialize it. So uh, to turn this into a function, we will call the function type class uh, from the types um, module. And uh, yeah, we have to pass a close as a second param parameter, but that's not really important here. And then we can call the function reverse shell. Okay. So uh, how can we assemble this malicious pico? Well, we can write the pico on hand because now we know how pico works. So uh, let's go through here uh, a bit quickly because we really don't have much time. So, uh, okay, on the first line here, we uh, are importing a function, the function that we're going to call. Uh, that is the, uh, well, it's not a function, it's a callable. Uh, it's the function type that is a class. Uh, so from model types, um, break line and callable function type. Okay, so uh, what parameters are we going to pass to the function type? Well, in the column 20, we create, we add a param uh, parenthesis to the know we're passing the arguments. And the first argument will be, well, we have to import another model. But we're importing the function loads from the Marshall model. And what we will pass to the loads function here on column 36, we have another open parenthesis denoting we're passing the parameters. And then we're having to import another function on column 37, that is the B64 decode from the base 64 method. Now we open the parenthesis on column 55 to pass the arguments to the B64 decode. And now we, we finally uh, add something uh, on hand that is uh, on column 56, we use the uppercase V to denote we're passing a string because what we want to decode uh, from base 64 is the, uh, the encoded function. So we add the, the encoded on base 64 function. We then close it with a T, a, a lowercase T. We close the arguments of, of B64 decode and we call with uh, uppercase R the B64 decode. Okay, so now we can close on column 83 the loads function and we can call the, the function on column 84 with the uppercase R reduce. Uh, now we need to pass the second parameter of the function type uh, callable, that is the globals. Um, so we need to import the globals from built in here on column 85. 
uh, we just pass on columns on 106 and 107 uh, an empty parameter. So there's no parameters here. And on column 108, we call the globose function with uh, the uppercase R. Uh, here on column uh, 111, uh, we close the parameters of the function type callable. And on line uh, 112, we call the function type. And uh, if you remember uh, correctly, uh, the function type will return the function. So now we need to run the function we created, that is the reverse shell function. To do that, we just open the parameters list. There is no parameter. So on column 113, we open the parameter. On column 114, we close the parameters list. And on column 115, we uh, have the uppercase R reduce to run the function. And yeah, when 116, we just end the pickle. So that's basically it. Uh, here is uh, a small demo for you, so you can see more clearly. On the right, we have a, a server waiting for the connection. And on the left, uh, I'm going to load the pickle, the malicious pickle we just created. And as soon as we load the pickle, boom, the victim, victim's computer is connected to the uh, attacker's computer. And now the attacker has access to the shell of the victim. And how can we prevent this? Uh, well, we can prevent this by signing the pickle with a, a secure cryptographic function like hash, like HMAC. So here is, a, is an example with that. And uh, having the hash, we can, uh, well, when we will, will load the pickle later, we can just check if the hash still matches. And if it matches, we know it's the same pickle we saved early, so we know it's safe. Or we can use an alternative. We can use a, a safer serialization format, such as JSON. So here we have JSON. JSON won't execute anything. OK, the third topic I want to talk about is the power of pip install, the pip install com. So uh, first, what happens when we run pip install? Uh, I'm, I divided this into uh, four steps. It's, of course, a bit more complicated than that, but uh, Let's reduce to, to four steps. Okay, so first uh, we have the identification of base requirements and given parameters. Uh, the second thing it does is the resolution of dependencies and determination of what will be installed. Uh, third, we uh, have the determination of installation method. And fourth, the, the last step is the installation of packages. And we're focusing now on the, the third step that is the determination of installation method. Uh, again, uh, I simplified this. Uh, it's a bit more complicated, but basically what it does is uh, it checks as if uh, there's a wheel available, and if there's a wheel, it will download the wheel and install from it. If there is no wheel, it will download the package source code, and if it's possible to build a wheel from the source code, it will build the wheel and install from it. If it's not possible, it will install from ctub.py. And ctub.py is a really interesting file because uh, with it, we can basically... Uh, set dynamic metadata for our packages. So on the left, we have a, an example of a ctep.py uh, file. It's really a Python file for uh, setting the, the metadata for the, the package. On the, on the right, we have examples of uh, commands we call from ctep.py. So first, we have the install to install it from the ctep.py. And second, to build the wheel. Uh, we use the, the, the second command here. And well, if it's a Python file, we can add the Python code we want. So to uh, execute arbitrary code uh, during the package installation, uh, I can just add the reverse shell code. It's basically the same reverse shell code uh, we used here in the, in, the, in the previous example with Pico. But instead of calling subprocess.call that uh, I was calling before, I'm using subprocess.popen to open a, a parallel process and uh, so the, the installation doesn't get uh, frozen. Um, yeah, so we have the, 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 this malicious code, uh, and then we, we have the setup as, is, as it will normally execute. Here's another uh, small demo for you. So on the right, we again have the server, and on the left, I'm installing a malicious package. And as soon as I uh, uh, call the, the command it stops, as soon as the command finishes, uh, the attacker has access to the victim's computer. Uh, and this is only with pip install. Uh, okay, so, but what are the real life risks with it? Because you can think, well, I'm not going to install uh, a package I, I don't know about. Uh, I only use 
common packages like requests or Django, Flask, stuff like that. But uh, there's a real life risk that is typo squaring. So uh, imagine you want to install the requests module, but uh, you're writing too fast, you're typing too fast, and you accidentally type requests with a typo as in this example here and uh, some hacker uh, added to PyPI uh, a malicious packager with this typo because well uh, they were expecting that someone would type uh, the name of request which is a popular package wrong and then well they they would uh, install the malicious package and this is something that really happened so uh, just in 2021 uh, PyPI deleted uh, almost 4,000 malicious libraries that were uploaded on PyPI. And in 2017, an user, uh, a Python user made a, an experiment uh, uploading packages to, to PyPI that had the same name as packages from the built-in library. So when a, a, a beginner user saw some example of someone using, let's say, JSON, they would think, oh, uh, that's something I need to install. And they would call pip install JSON and would, they would install the, the package this user uploaded that in this case, it's not malicious. It was just an experiment, but it could be malicious. Uh, there's also a risk with extra index URL because uh, if we're not getting from the, the PyPI uh, repository, and even with, if we get the name correctly, we can, uh, if you're getting from a private repository, can uh, we can get a malicious package and here uh, I won't get into much detail with that but I added uh, this million text as an example because uh, this guy made a, a lot of money doing that uh, okay for prevention we can use the flag only binary to only uh, install the package if it has a real binary we can use the flag require hashes that will verify the the hash sum of the the files and we should never download a package as sudo or as admin so that even if something happens uh, it won't really damage much um yeah okay let's go to the fourth topic outdated dependencies uh so basically uh vulnerabilities are found all the time so uh, uh especially with this uh packages and programs and softwares that a lot of people use uh, a lot of people find uh, lots of vulnerabilities all the time. Here I, I have an example with Django, so I don't, I'm not sure if it's still the, the latest uh, Django release, but uh, it's the 406 release that fixes a security issue that is a potential SQL injection. So this happens all the time. If you check the release notes of other versions, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of security bugs fixed, and this is with uh, a lot of packages we use because um, people all find our vulnerabilities all the time. And if we don't keep up with that, we can end up using a, a vulnerable version of a package we use. So to prevent this, we must keep up with the releases of the packages we use. And uh, it's nice to keep up with the CVE vulnerabilities list. Uh, so uh, as you can see here, uh, we have a, a CVE number for this vulnerability. And if you keep up with the CVE uh, list, you can uh, check the, the if there's a new vulnerability. Uh, the five topic is uh, similar to the, the last topic. It's about outdated Python. So again, vulnerabilities are found all the time. These are some Python vulnerabilities uh, and when they were disclosed. And yeah, they're found all the time. And uh, it's important to understand the status of the Python versions because uh, after some time, uh, the Python version, a Python version may be, may reach its end of life. So as for now, uh, the last Python version supported is the 3.7 uh, and it's getting the, the security releases. So if uh, some, some user finds a security bug in, in Python, uh, we'll fix it from 3.7 to the, the main branch, but uh, from 3.6, uh, backwards, we won't fix it. Uh, so the security bugs found now won't be fixed for these previous versions. And it's important to understand that. So uh, if it's possible, we should never use uh, a uh, unsupported Python version. We should always try to keep up with that. I know it's not always possible because it's not always uh, our decision, but 
it's something we should keep in mind. Uh, and we should be cautious with deprecated functions. So uh, we have a few of that on uh, Python's built-in library, uh, standard library. We have a few functions that uh, are deprecated that we don't use anymore, but we keep for uh, backwards compatibility. So here I'm showing an example with the make temp function from the temp file module. It's a function that we don't use anymore because we have better ways to do that. And the function has a, a security problem that uh, it may create a, a race condition that, uh, yeah. And it's, it's a function we don't need to use anymore because we have better options, but the function still exists in the library. So it's important to, to know uh, about deprecated functions. Okay, the sixth thing I want to talk is the problem with pseudo randomness. Okay, so uh, I saw this tweet a while ago. Uh, the person was claiming to, to, uh, to be showing how to make a secure password generator in four simple lines of Python code. And the code uh, is basically this here down below that uh, the person is importing the, the choice function from the random module. Uh, and it's basically uh, choosing uh, with random.choice method uh, random characters from the sequence of characters here. And they're choosing 32 random characters. Uh, but this has a problem because the random module uses something called C and the seed can be manually set. Uh, so if we manually set the seed, uh, in this example, I'm setting to Euro Python, um, we get and we, we do the same thing the, the person showed in, the, in their example, but we just set the, 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 the seed first, we will always get the same result. So if you get your computer here and you just there and you just try to, to copy this code, you, you do the same thing, uh, choosing uh, 32 random characters from this sequence of characters, but setting the same seed, Euro Python first, you will get the same result. You will get the same password because uh, that's how seeds work. Uh, if we don't set, uh, uh, if we don't manually set a seed, uh, Python will get the seed from the current time. So uh, even if we don't know what is the seed if we don't manually set the seed? Uh, we can, uh, if we know when the the password was generated, we can brute force it, and we will know what password what password was generated. And alternatives, we have uh, a few alternatives to to that. So if we need uh, something secure, uh, something randomly secure, uh, we have the secrets module that is the most appropriate for that. Uh, and the secrets have module have basically. Uh, uh, similar functions to the to the the random module. So here we're using secrets.choice instead of random.choice, and now it's secure because uh, it doesn't use the the seed scheme that random uses. We have we also have the method the function token hacks, so we can just create a, a token uh, with the bytes we specified. Uh, we can also use os.eRandom uh, method. It's a bit more complicated, but we can do that. I'm showing that here. I'm not going in, into much detail because of the time. And uh, we can use the class system random on the random module. It's the only safe, cryptographically, cryptographically safe, cryptographically secure uh, thing in the, in the random module. So uh, the only uh, class that is safe on the, on the random module is the system random class. Anything else is not cryptographically secure. You can use it for uh, other things, but you shouldn't use it for something that needs to be cryptographically secure. Okay, so uh, the seventh topic is uh, about bomb files and I call watch out for bomb files. Uh, so basically Python is, uh, uh, Python's uh, libraries to read XML uh, is vulner are vulnerable to uh, an attack called billion left attack. So this attack basically uh, opens a, a, an XML with lots of uh, references for variables that references itself and well, we, it's basically uh, a small file that when you load it, it will use a lot of memory from the computer. Uh, and yeah, so to prevent that, we can use uh, a library called diffused XML. This is recommended uh, by the, the, the standard documentation of Python, this library. We can use the library to protect for these bomb files, this bomb XML. So here is an example of trying to load this malicious XML with this diffused XML package, and uh, we will get uh, an error. It won't load. 
we also have a problem with star files uh, or zip files as well. So, but this example is with uh, a tar bomb with path traversal. So, uh, the if the the tar file if some tar file is some file in the tar file is specified to uh, a path with double dots, it will be extracted uh, to this path with double dots. So double dots means uh, the the parent um, the parent directory. So uh, yeah, so uh, it will do that if we try to to extract it, extract it to uh, a specific folder in our computer. It will then is extracted to the parent of the parent of the parent of this folder. Uh, and we don't want that, of course. So if we use the extract all, that is a common method, uh, we would call with star file. We will do that. Uh, it's not going to ask for our permission. We we'll just do that. And we don't have a diffuse star uh, package as we have with XML. But uh, to prevent that, we just shouldn't use extract all. We should uh, prior inspect the files in the tar file. So here is an example of how we can do that. Um, uh, iterating through the files in the tar file. And if I find a, a double dot, uh, I raise an error. I can do the inspection uh, in better ways, of course. But this is just uh, an example of that. Uh, the eighth topic I want to, to bring today is about assert, and it's called uh, assert is for debug. And uh, okay, so what is the purpose of assert? So assert, uh, what it does is verify if an expression is true. And if it's not true, it will raise an assertion error. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, packages like PyTest and we use assert to test. Uh, so it's a nice use of assert. Uh, and people uh, oftentimes use the use assert to kind of save a line. So uh, on the right, uh, I have an example of just checking if a, a password that I get with get pass uh, matches a secret password that is uh, hard coded here, and if it doesn't match, I will raise a value error uh, telling the user that they got the wrong password. And in the second, the second example, I won't raise a value error. I won't check uh, if the password doesn't match uh, in 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 an if condi in an if condition. I will just call assert. So here on line seven, uh, I won't need two lines. I will just need one line. So uh, I use assert, and this is the message that will assert we raise if uh, this is false, this condition is false. Uh, the problem is these uh, are not equivalent. So uh, and people think, people often think that uh, uh, assert is just checking if the past, that if the, uh, the variable, if the, the condition is not true. But what uh, assert is actually doing is checking first if the constant dunder debug is true, and then it checks if, if the condition uh, is true or not. Uh, and what is this constant deep, the under debug? Uh, this the under debug constant uh, is basically set by the uh, O flag of the Python interpreter. So here uh, I'm calling Python, uh, I'm using Python as uh, I use normally. Uh, I'm calling the, the I'm, I'm getting the, the under debug uh, constant, and I see that it's set to true. So when I use uh, assert, I get the, and I uh, pass a, a false condition, I get the assertion error. But in the second example, um, I'm using the, the O flag, that means optimize. And now the dunder debug constant, constant is set to false. So when I call assert, nothing happens. Uh, I won't get an assertion error. So if your program depends on that uh, and someone uses the, the O flag, it will fail. Uh, okay, so now I'm just, going to show to you how we can audit our code. So how can we uh, check for security vulnerabilities in our code? Uh, and instead of just having to, to manually look for that, we have lots of options. So uh, here I, I list some of these options. I will, I will focus just in one, but these are all great options. I will focus in just Bandit. I will show how you can use Bandit, which is an open source uh, package you can install. Uh, you basically uh, just call Bandit inside, in, inside the package, inside the, the program repository. Uh, and the, 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 the result will be uh, the security vulnerabilities that Bandit fo found. And yeah, and some metrics about that. So in this case, in this package I have, 
uh, it just showed that uh, I have I'm using pseudo random. So in this example, uh, I'm showing this package I have. It's showing that uh, I'm using a pseudo random generator that is not safe for security for uh, cryptographic purposes. It's the thing I talked before about random numbers, but in this case, uh, I know that I'm not using for cryptographic purposes, so that's okay with me, but uh, Bandit checked that for me. Okay, so that's basically it. But, uh, okay, now you're, you're going to leave this talk. I want you to leave this talk knowing uh, a few things for sure. So these are key points to never forget. The first one is never trust user input. So uh, I have, uh, we, we had a few topics about that. We had the Evo topic, the Pico topic, and, uh, and, and even the, the tar file and the, the XML file. You should never trust user input. Always validate uh, what the user is sending you. Uh, don't uh, get the, the input and run anything. Never trust user input. And the second thing here is uh, avoid running Python code as sudo or as admin, uh, because well, if we end up uh, somehow executing a malicious code, it's important that the attacker doesn't have uh, sudo access, so it doesn't have access to everything. So it's important the, the attacker access will be limited, uh, and that's why it's important to avoid running Python code as sudo or as admin. The third topic, the third key point is keep your system up to date. So uh, update your, your system, update your dependencies, uh, keep up with the security releases of the, the packages and the softwares you use. Uh, the fourth topic is uh, read the documentation. And I know sometimes the, the official documentation may not be the, the best place to really learn Python or uh, uh, really uh, Get uh, get a hand on how to use something, some um, some packages, some module, uh, but uh, the docs are full of these warnings. So uh, if there's a place that is going to have these uh, security warnings, it's the docs. So you should uh, even if you don't use the docs to to learn how to use something, you should check the docs if there's some some security caveat, uh, like the Pico module has a, a security warning, the tar file has a security warning, the random module has a security warning. So it's important to read the docs because of that. And the fifth topic is you should use uh, a static code analysis tool like Bandit, but you can use uh, any other one. You can use uh, more than one option. Uh, but you should use the static code analysis to uh, automatically check for security vulnerabilities in our code. And that's basically it for today. Thank you. Uh, these are my contacts. If you have any questions that can be answered right now. But yeah, that's it. I hope you had a, a, a good time in this talk. Bye-bye, guys.